So several weeks ago, uh, I went for a CAT scan. I think this, that's what it was called. It was uh, you know, one of those things you had to get in the machine, and it was a, it was a scan of my chest. And you know, I show up at the medical office, and the, uh, I, was, I was met promptly on time by a uh, very polite, confident, young male technician who took me back to the room where the procedure was going to happen, and uh, just very positive and professional. Uh, I was in a hurry, as as normal for me. It was it was early in the morning. I had a lot to do. I think I was the first appointment. And uh, as he's beginning his explanation as to what is going on, I'm kind of presumptuous. Again, I'm in a hurry. Hadn't given much thought to this. Uh, and he says, you're going to take your shirt off, and you're going to get on this little thing here and lay down and the things. And as he's saying it, I'm taking my shirt off, and I'm getting on the little thing. And he said, wow, you must be in a hurry. And I said, yeah, man, I'm in a hurry. And he said, okay. And he, start, he pushes the button, and he starts moving me into the machine. And as he's moving me into the machine, he says, um, hey, you're not, you don't have a problem with claustrophobia, do you? And I thought, do I have a problem with claustrophobia? <laughs> <laughs> which I hadn't thought about prior to the question, and remembered um, a couple of years ago uh, when I got caught. This is what I thought about going to this machine, starting to come over me. Uh, as I got caught in an elevator in a parking garage in Florence, Italy, the, 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 the elevator was, was not much bigger than I am, and I had four four huge Sharon Smith packed suitcases for this long trip we were doing in Europe. And I, and it was probably, uh, it was, it was August in, in Florence and it was probably literally 120 degrees in that elevator. And I could not, and I got stuck. And anyway, since that time, just to be frank, had I ever had a problem with claustrophobia? No. But since then, just to be honest in front of a few intimate friends, uh, I've been a little weirded out a few times in closed spaces. This is what comes to my mind as I'm going in, in this thing. And I said, wait, wait. <laughs> I said, wait just a minute. Can, can I come back out for a minute? And he says, sure, and he pushes a button and he comes out, but before I'm out of the machine, I'm out of the machine. And I, <laughs> I'm standing there shirtless uh, with a cold sweat on my brow, embarrassed, and I said, man, I'm embarrassed, but uh, I, I, I should have thought about this for a second. I, I didn't even know how long the thing was. Am I in here for an hour? Am I in here for three minutes? I, I, I need, let's just, uh, and, and he says, well, I, I was going to offer you that explanation, you jumped in the machine, but I just want you to know, everything's good. Everything's good. This is normal. Um, I'm not in a hurry this morning. We can take as much time as you want uh, to work this out. And he, he, he gives me a glass of water, and uh, I'm standing there feeling awkward. Gives me a glass of water. He walks me around the machine so I can see it. And uh, we have this get this little rapport going. And then I said, okay, man, I'm ready. Let's rock and roll. And I, you know, I get in there and go in the machine and everything is good and fine. In fact, it was kind of fun because he's now, you know, I'd given a little thought and I was mentally prepared and he's back in the control booth thing, talking through the microphone and we're going back and forth, asking each other questions. As I'm leaving, I mentioned to him that I'm a pastor. I don't do, I hide that from a lot of people. To a lot of people, when I'm on vacation, I'm an author, by the way. Uh, being a pastor messes up everything uh, with, with people like that. But anyway, all of a sudden people are wanting to talk about eschatology, and I'm just wanting to drink a Diet Coke. And <laughs> <laughs> or other libations. And anyway, I mentioned I'm a pastor, which is always a little bit of a risk, and he beams. And he says, you know what? The, the, the first minute I met you, I knew you were a person of faith. And I thought, yeah, but I bet you got over that about five minutes later. <laughs> and then he said something fascinating to me. He said, you know, my goal is that, that when people meet me, they know I'm a person of faith. And I thought about it, and I said to him, you know what? I would have to say I knew you were a person of faith. 
I knew that you were a person of faith when you greeted me. You demonstrated it by the way you did your job. Uh, you were, you've been incredibly hospitable. Your calming presence turned my, my anxiety into peace. Your empathetic and clear communication you know, made uh, plain to me what I was about to experience. The excellence with which you did your work demonstrated to me that you are a person of faith. So, in recent weeks, we've been teaching about how God does His work through our work. We've talked, for instance, one of many examples, about how God can and sometimes does miraculously heal the sick, but He usually uses people who work in the various sectors of the medical profession to heal us. And on this particular day, God used a specialized technician in part of that process for me. We've talked about how that the reformer Martin Luther, all the way back in the early 16th century, whose theology has shaped the way that we think about vocation in Western civilization and beyond, talked about how this person, or someone like him, this technician, is a mask God is wearing and through whom God does his work. But key to this, and what I want to emphasize today, is that this young man identified himself as a person of faith. He was, he was mindful that he was a person of faith in his workplace. He connected his faith to his work. And this means, in my view, that not only was he then more effective and meaningful in terms of his work uh, towards me, but also that his work was more meaningful to him. He was mindful of the transcendent meaning of his work. He is a person of faith. And I submit to you that being intentional about being a person of faith in our work is so important to connecting our work to God's work, doing our best work, and doing work that brings us meaning. I'll say that again. Being intentional about being a person of faith in our work is important to connecting our work to God's work. We have an awareness we're doing God's work. That we're in the classroom, we are, we, are, we are wearing God's mask teaching those kids how to read or whatever. We're, we, we're, we, are, we have an awareness of this. And that this helps us to do our best work. And that this helps us to do work that brings us meaning. There's a passage of scripture we've talked about a good bit over the few, fast, past few weeks that Martin Luther, again the reformer, uh, uh, spent a lot of time talking about when it came to the subject of vocation. Uh, Luther's opinion uh, was, his theology was, that whatever work we've been assigned to is work that we've been called to if we're believers. We're believing that we're not where we are by accident. Even if that's not where we're always supposed to be, we're believing God's at work in our lives. And then whatever work we've been assigned to, we've been called to, and Luther said, according to the passage I'm about to read, that we are supposed to live as a believer there. We're supposed to be a person of faith in that situation. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Now, I'm going to focus on the living as a believer, being a person of faith today. And when I talk about living as a believer, I'm, I'm doing it in two ways. One is the vertical emphasis. This is what we focused on some last week, talking about finding people who try to find their identity in their work. We talked about how that we find our identity through our, our relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. So we're talking about being a person of faith in terms of the vertical nature of faith, which is to say... When we believed in the gospel, the good news about Jesus, we were declared right by God, or justified, and that we are now everything that God requires a person to be. When you know that, when that's settled, it impacts everything about your life. You know who you are in relationship to God. So part of being a person of faith is believing in Jesus 
and being in right relationship with God. That impacts everything about who you are and everything about your life. But secondly, I want to talk about it in horizontal terms. I want to talk about how that our faith gets worked out through us in the world around us. And how that we need to have an awareness that as a person of faith, God is using us to impact the environment around us and the people in our lives. So when we live as a, as a believer in our work life, it has powerful impact. And I'm not just talking about being a good and moral person. I know a lot of times when somebody thinks, you know, um, that uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to live as a believer in the workplace. That means I'm going to be a good person, and 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 obviously that's essential to all of this. But I want to take it way beyond just being a good person. I'm talking. I want to talk about doing good and impactful work. I want to talk about actually impacting the place that you are in. There's a great passage of Scripture that captures both of these, the being a good person and impacting the environments in which we work. First Thessalonians, uh, pardon me, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, has Paul saying, we constantly pray for you that God may make you worthy of his calling. Remember the premise here. We're saying wherever you've been assigned to work, As a believer, you believe that at least for right now, you've been called to work there. You're living as a believer there. So Paul is praying in another context. He's saying, I'm praying that God will make you worthy of your calling. In other words, live up to what God's assigned you to, and that by his power, everybody please say power. God's power is going to get involved in this now, okay? That by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. I want to go there and I want to be a good person. And your every deed prompted by faith. So God, by his power, is going to make you worthy of the thing you've been called to because because he's going to bring to fruition your every desire for goodness, but not just that. You're not just the nice little Christian over there, you know, being sweet. He's also, by his power, going to bring to fruition every deed prompted by your faith. So there's an assumption that in the environment you're in, you are a person of faith about the deeds, the work that you're going to do. And God's power, if, we, if we're believers, gets involved in this and brings a beyond normal, supernatural reality to the, to the work that we do. Now, last week, and now I want to pick up where I left off last week, um, and knowing that A lifetime has passed since last week. I'll take just a moment to kind of remind you and me what I talked about, okay? We talked last week, and we have talked in this series, about how that work is sourced in God. That the first time we learn about work is God and his creative activity and creating the world. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, a number of times refers to God doing his work. And um, work began in God. And then secondly, when he created humanity, he assigned humanity work to do. And this was part of God blessing humanity, which is to say, just to remind you, work is not a part of the curse. Work is a part of the blessing. Work was part of God's original plan. Work was something God designed. In this trimester, we're talking about human flourishing. Work is part of what God designed to flourish us. Now, however... Adam and Eve fell. So work and work being good is a pre-fall reality, but it also has, as everything else does, a post-fall reality. When Adam and Eve decided to do their life their way instead of God's way, and they fell, uh, and, and the world uh, became broken, well now work, even though it's a gift from God, has to be understood in this context of what's going on in a fallen world. And you see this is part of uh, important enough for God to mention it in, in when he was telling Adam kind of what the consequences of the curse was for him. To Adam he said, Genesis 3.17, Cursed is the ground because of you, the choices that he made. Through painful toil you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. This wasn't what had been happening in Eden to that point, but now they're being cast into the wilderness. This is now 
the, the fallenness is now a reality. Now the work that I've given you to do, there's going to be some painful toil to it. Through painful toil, you'll eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. So we've learned from the, the, the teaching of Scripture and the latest research, which we've talked a lot about, that work is one of the most important things God uses to flourish us. But we also know from Scripture and from our own experience that we can expect work to have its share of painful toil, thorns and thistles, and sweaty brows. Work now happens. The glory of work, the goodness of work, the God-ordained potential of work happens in the context of fallenness. Painful toil, thorns and thistles, sweaty brows is part of the reality of work for, I think, probably all of us, every one of us. There's a certain amount of thorn and thistles to all of this. And so last week I introduced this metaphor of the rose. I see in, in the rose, I see the, the potential of something to flower and to be beautiful. I see something flourishing. But I also acknowledge the, the thorns. And the fact that as beautiful as the rose is, there is a duality to this. There's tremendous potential. And ultimately, you know, when we think about a rose, we're, we're not focused on the thorns, are we? We're focused on the beauty and the fragrance of the flower, which is where we need to get to. When you buy your wife, guys, a dozen roses for uh, Valentine's Day, you're not think, you don't go to the florist and say, hey, I want a, a, a dozen stems with thorns on them. You say, I want a dozen roses. And, and, and ultimately, this is how I have to think about this. We're going to focus on the flower. We're going to acknowledge the reality of the thorns. So last week, I introduced uh, two thorns and three roses. And this week, I want to talk about three thorns and three roses. Last week, I promised that I would come back with part two of that message. And uh, I also, if I, ever, if I ever decide to start a rock band, I'm going to call it Thorns and Roses. But that's a, subject, that's a subject for another day. So here's the first thorn. Here's the first thorn. A toxic work environment. Now, I want to offer a qualifier. It's so important that you give me some grace today, as always. I always need grace when I preach because you never say everything just right and you never cover everything that should be covered, and it's really kind of impossible to do. And I need grace when I speak, and particularly when I get into some of this stuff today that's so real to so many of our lives. I just want to say, nothing I'm going to talk about am I going to talk about comprehensively. I'm not going to cover every case. There are exceptions to the rule. I want to acknowledge an issue, and then I have a certain emphasis. I want to talk about how to be a person of faith in light of that thing. And that's going to be my emphasis today. It doesn't mean there aren't all kinds of things that we could talk about, that many of you could talk about, perhaps better even than I could from your own set of experiences. So just know that I, I'm acknowledging, I'm not going to, when I talk about a toxic work environment, I'm going to touch it. I'm not going to, you know, there's a lot more to be said about it. And that's going to be true of, of all the things I say if I quit it qualifying what I'm going to say and actually go ahead and say it. All right. A toxic work environment is a symptom of any number of factors, including ineffective bosses, unclear goals, poor communication, unrealistic workloads, lack of recognition, inhospitable policies, and much more. But it seems to me, and this is what I want to focus on, that whatever is not right in an organization and every organization has thorns and thistles, is worsened and multiplied by negative people who focus on the thorns more than they focus on the contribution that they might make to increase organizational well-being. Toxicity, again, it seems to me, this is one aspect of it. Toxicity is multiplied by whatever the opposite is of a person of faith. 
In other words, when people begin to focus on the toxicity, it doesn't help the toxicity, it worsens worsens the toxicity, and human nature is, sadly, as fallen people listen, uh, living in a fallen world, human nature is to focus on the thorn and not the rose. We've talked in the past uh, about emotional contagion, about the, uh, the concept of emotional contagion, the very real scientifically provable fact that people catch emotions from each other. Sadly, it seems easier to catch a negative emotion from someone than it does a positive emotion, although I think we have the opportunity as people of faith to actually turn that around in the environments in which we work. Uh, Sean Acor, uh, the Harvard professor who uh, has written so, uh, several bestsellers on the subject of happiness, incredibly well-researched work, writes this. He writes in, in uh, The Happiness Advantage, he writes, studies revealed there was a 17 to 1 negative to positive ratio of research in the field of psychology. In other words, for every one study about happiness and thriving, there were 17 studies on depression and disorder. As a society, we know very well how to be unwell and miserable and so little about how to thrive. And he talks about that a a little while, particularly as it concerns education. And then this pattern of focusing on the negative pervades not only our research and schools, but our society. Turn on the news, and the majority of airtime is spent on accidents, corruption, murders, abuse. This focus on the negative tricks our brains into believing that this sorry ratio is reality, that most of life is negative. And then, I like this a lot, he says, ever heard of medical school syndrome? In the first year of medical school, as students listen to all the diseases and symptoms that can befall a person, many aspiring doctors become suddenly convinced that they have come down with all of them. A few years ago, my brother-in-law called me from Yale Medical School, Acor writes, and told me he had leprosy. But I had no idea how to console him because he had just gotten over a week of menopause and was very sensitive. (laughs) And we all know there's truth to that, right? If someone's not feeling well and they start telling you there's how they're feeling and they discuss their symptoms, I mean, it's, it's hard sometimes to think, Yo, you know, my stomach's kind of bothered me a little bit right now as well. Anyway, we, we catch emotions from one another, and sadly enough, it seems particularly easy because there's such a focus on the negative things to catch negative emotions from each other. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't toxic work environments. Clearly they are. And pretty much every work environment has some toxicity somewhere. Again, whatever work we're doing, even church work is done in the context of a fallen world. So, but, but, but even though we acknowledge that there's toxicity in work environments, my question to you as a person of faith is how are you going to live in that reality? Again, I acknowledge there are a hundred other things we could talk about, but this is the thing that I feel led, I guess, to spiritualize it, to talk about to you today. So yes, there's toxicity. The question is, what are you going to offer in response to it as a perfect, uh, as as a person of faith? Now, It may be that you're in a toxic work environment where the right thing to do is to have the courage to quit and go find another job because it is what it is. And and, and, and many times that's a valid, very valid thing to do. But today what I want to suggest is that if you choose to stay, you must also choose to live as a believer in that place to which you have been called. The only choice you have is to live as a believer there. What did the Apostle Paul say, 1 Corinthians seven seventeen. He said, live as a believer in whatever situation you have been assigned to because that's where you have been called to. So frankly, if I may be so bold, you as a person of faith really have no choice except to be a person of faith 
wherever it is, you have been assigned. This past week, Sharon and I uh, went out uh, for a breakfast, and uh, we were sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a restaurant. Next to us, there was a, a round table with about 10 chairs around it. And uh, I'm watching as a, clearly a team from some company is being, is being treated to breakfast by their boss. And they, they're, they're, they're all coming in, and I'm watching them, and, and I overhear their conversation. Actually, I'm eavesdropping. I'm interested in organizational leadership stuff. So I'm kind of list, kind of, I like watching those kind of dynamics. And, and uh, I'm watching people get settled and watching how people greet each other. And, and, and part of what I saw was the boss was just really, really excited. He was excited. He was excited. I, I, you know, I heard him say, I'm so glad, you know, some of the team wasn't here. So we're all able to get around this table and come to a restaurant and we aren't normally able to get out of the office. He's really happy. He's getting to buy breakfast for everybody, you know, probably on the company platinum American express. And, 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 and plus he clearly had a presentation to make. I know this because he brought this gigantic, great big, like oversized briefcase in with a whiteboard type easel presentation thing on it and it, it was clear he was he was he was locked and loaded he was ready to go and and so excited and somebody at the table says uh oh man the weather is really really bad this morning and in fact it, it really really was which it really really has been right oh, for uh, it's craziness how many of you have water in your basement this morning a little bit me too so congrats anybody wants to help me out. Uh, anyway, it's crazy. Anyway, see, so this person says, yeah, the weather's really bad today. It's a really bad hair day. And I thought, oh, I know. And, <laughs> and, then, and, and, and then somebody else real loudly, kind of a, a dominant kind of person at the table said, yeah, the weather's so bad, it makes you not even want to go to work. And I thought, there's got to be one in every group of 10, <laughs> right? What did she just accomplish by making that statement? That, you know, nervous laughter around the table. The boss is sitting there. Now, he's, oh, yeah. It's, uh, and, 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 and this, you know, all this boss is bringing all this positivity and so excited. And this person is sitting there saying, nanny, 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 nanny. And I thought, you know, I too often in my in my in my <laughs> in my work life ha have have I had that person, all former employees, by the way, sitting at the table when you you're 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 all excited about how you're going to change the world, and and there's somebody there who is creating a toxic emotional contagion. What good happened by that statement? Which causes me then to ask us, if someone had an awareness of sitting in that environment as a person of faith, would they make a statement like that? I want to suggest to you, perhaps we can, look, let's be honest, there are all days that we may not be excited to go to work. I mean, I'm working on spring forward, West Orange Patrick's Day, prayed day, day. But I, I have to reframe it in a positive way, right? Like the people who are going to be there really want to be there. And so I'm pumped up and excited. And uh, to bless you, I'm going to preach longer than usual. So just know that. Uh, actually, not much longer. But, but somehow or another, the person of faith, it's not that the person of faith says, Pollyannish, oh, the sun's shining today. Because everybody can look out the window and see the sun isn't shining. It was, in fact, dreary. It was a bad hair day. I do get that point. But the person of faith is reframing things from a faith perspective. Always, guys, always reframing things from a faith perspective. So perhaps the person says, man, the weather really stinks today. It's a bad hair day. Day. And the other person says, yeah, the weather's really nasty. It's been horrible. But what a good day for us to, you know, we can't be outside. What a thank you, Mr. Boss, for bringing us out today. We get to have breakfast together and have a good time, and we get to do good work today. Why not frame it as a, as a see, that's the kind of thing, guys, that a person of faith would do. They're not just sitting there being a nice moral person, not you know, stealing from the restaurant. 
They're impacting on the environment by speaking in ways that would indicate this is a person who knows who they are. This is a person who's at peace. This is a person of faith. This is a person who's, when they speak, they speak in ways where they even take bad news and, and they, don't, they don't act like there's not bad news. They just reframe it in a way where it feels like good news. This is the kind of person I want to be around. This is the kind of person I want on my team. This is the kind of person I want leading my team. This is the kind of person I want to give a raise to. This is the kind of person I want to give big bonuses to. This is the kind of person I want training the new people who are coming up. What kind of people would you expect to be received that way? People of faith. So, so each of us have to decide whether or not to be a blesser or curser. We can, we can radiate one or the other. The, 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 the apostle James wrote and said, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness, meaning we can come here on a Sunday morning and with our tongue, praise Jesus, but on Monday morning in the meeting, we can curse the other human, I don't mean literally use profanity, but you know what I mean. Speak in ways that bring not blessing, but cursing to the people who are around us. But these people are made in God's likeness. That was, that was the point James was making. Don't go to church and say, praise Jesus, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. And the next day at work, be all negative and sad and down and, you know, acting like, you know, this is, uh, you're, you're just lucky. I came to work today. Everybody's being quiet. Am I? I'm not offending anybody, am I? Because I'm looking at you guys, and I know, you know, so many of you, and I know the kind of people you are. You act like people of faith in every environment of your life. And if you need a little tweaking today, the, and you feel a little convicted by something, if you were that person at that restaurant this week, I love you, but don't come to my meetings. <laughs> out of the same mouth come praise and cursing my brothers and sisters this should not be so 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 that's the thorn here's the rose the rose i think is pretty obvious the rose is you you are the rose in this situation of toxic environments why because you're a person of faith you believe in god you have peace with god this radiates from you believe in people made in god's likeness and you believe that even negative situations can turn to good this doesn't mean again that you ignore challenges or toxicity or that you don't find ways to confront them but even when you confront them you confront them in positive ways as much as is possible you know who you are you believe god is at work in and through you you radiate blessing not cursing again you're not pollyanna you know it's like like Paul sitting in prison, writing to the Philippians. He doesn't want to be in prison. He made it clear he didn't want to be in prison. He was in a situation he didn't want to be in. But he believed that for that moment he was assigned, and that's where he was supposed to be, but he's hoping it's not going to be long. But this is what he says in that context. Philippians 4.18, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then a couple beats later, I have learn the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So if you're in a prison like sometimes it feels toxic kind of work environment, but you believe that's where you've been assigned and called at this point, then you've got to be the person who says, finally, brothers and sisters, I'm looking around and somehow or another, I'm going to find whatever is good in here. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to multiply that. I'm going to be a positive emotional contagion. I can be content in this situation, even though it's not ideal. How are you going to do that? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God by his power is going to bring to fruition every desire for goodness and he's going to help me accomplish every deed prompted by my faith. I am a person of faith. I love something Hazrat Inyat Khan said. Some people look for a beautiful place. Others make a place beautiful. And you are that kind of person. Let's talk about this thorn. Let's talk about shadowy, shadowy ethics. Shadowy ethics are, of course, a step beyond toxicity or an extreme form, perhaps, 
of toxicity. So what if you find yourself, and I know many of you do, in a work situation where ethical boundaries are regularly crossed, where it's difficult to do good work because some of what's taking place is just not morally good. Again, one option is that that can reach an extreme where the only moral choice is to leave. Let's just acknowledge that. That there are times when you begin by your presence to become complicit in something that's not right and you know at, at having done anything you can to make a positive impact there you know other people's wills are engaged as well so other people have choices to make and you know the, that the thing for you to do is to leave again uh, as difficult as that can be uh, that's not what I want to focus on today what I what I want I just want to acknowledge that that sometimes that's the right thing to do but probably for most of us we're where we are at because we feel assigned there because we feel called there because we feel like that's where we're supposed to be so what what do we do how do we live and work in a broken world with broken human beings who lead organizations that will have some brokenness somewhere as well we have to figure out how to be a person of faith there. So that's the thorn, the rose, is to overcome evil with good. It's an amazing passage here uh, in Romans that uh, says so much in so few words. It's where the Apostle Paul said to Romans, you know, living in difficult times, in fact, tr uh, trying to work through submitting to governing authorities who were not by any uh, uh, idea motivated by a Christian worldview or Judeo-Christian moral and ethical uh, thoughts. And so Paul's trying to write to them, how do you live in this situation where you're submitted to authority that's, you know, not, you, you would wonder whether or not you can follow that person. And this is what Paul said in part, if it is possible... If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't give in. Don't become a part of it. But overcome evil with good. I really felt strongly this week to encourage some of you to consider the possibility that you are where you are because you are needed there. Jesus said we're supposed to be salt and light. Why, 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 what, what does salt do? Well, in the, in, the, in the time of Jesus, you guys know this, salt was used to preserve meat that would become rotten otherwise. And salt was used to flavor meat once it had been cooked, right? Why, why do you need salt? You need salt because something could become rotten without it. And some of us are in situations that are rotten, and the reason God put you there is because you're the one who God's put as a good force in perhaps a somewhat evil situation, and you are the influence God put there to do his work. Don't be surprised when you find yourself hanging out with you know, people who are messed up. People are messed up. All of us are messed up a little bit. It's not like shock, shock, shock. It's like, okay, here I am. Why did you put me here? We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. Why do you need light? Why do you need light, guys? Because it's dark out there. Right? And so we need Christians who have mindsets that say, I'm not going to become a part of the problem, but, but, I, but I do see myself being a force for good here. That doesn't mean Bible thumping, you know, you know uh, wearing a born-again bumper sticker across your forehead and, 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 and being, frankly, some off-putting, you know, uh, preachy, just... just impact the environment around you with the good that you are and the good that you do. So 
So the fact is that, uh, that we need people of faith teaching in public schools, leading on Wall Street, engaged in the political arena, making films in Hollywood, selling automobiles. I'm not saying that those arenas are evil. I'm just, I'm just trying to make this point that, that people of faith can't all be working in churches and missional nonprofits, right? That's not the reality for the vast majority of us. You, you, I know many of you look at me and you, the job I have and you say you're doing God's work, but I'm looking at you and saying you're doing God's work. You're doing God's work, off time in a more difficult environment than I could possibly understand. God put you there. You are salt. You are light. You are a person of faith in a broken and fallen world. God is using you to do his work. Great story I read this week uh, about a guy uh, who faced an ethical dilemma. He had a, a, a high-powered position leading a, a division in a, in a uh, Wall Street private equity uh, firm, and um, uh, the, the team that worked for him identified an excellent investment opportunity that would provide a good return for his team and company and customers. The only problem was that this business and this guy's estimate was not only not doing good, but it actually was, was, was doing harm societally. It wasn't illegal, and the, the firm he worked for had no problem uh, 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 investing and, and making money off of this business. But this guy, you know, is torn between his obligation to the company and, and, and uh, uh, his team and, and his customers to seize, you know, meaningful financial opportunities while feeling uh, conflicted because he knew the harm that this particular company was doing. He had the ability, if he wanted, to veto it. And after wrestling with this ethical dilemma, which is what you do, guys, right? You wrestle with ethical dilemmas. It'd be nice if everything was black and white, but there's a lot of gray when it comes to these kind of things, right? And so he wrestles with it, and he decided the best thing he could do was to not say no to the opportunity because he knew the bank next door uh, metaphorically, would quickly take the business and the thing would still go on whether whichever bank was investing in it. But he announced to his team that though he was saying yes to it, that he was personally refusing the, his part of the bonus that was going to come from that particular business. Now, that's one of, you know, all kinds of different ways that we might think about things. But, but, but what, what I'm trying to say is I'm encouraging some of you who are working in difficult places with, with, with ethical and moral dilemmas that if it's possible, if it's possible, Romans 12, stay there if it's possible and try to overcome evil with good. We need people of faith in people in places like that. You'll remember uh, real quickly before, man, I'm really running late today. Um, you will remember quick uh, 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 the story of Esther in the Old Testament. And Esther's a, a, a Jewish girl who, 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 by a series of questionable, questionable ethical <laughs> actions, becomes married to the king of Persia. And uh, 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 this is part of the Babylonian captivity era. And uh, uh, she doesn't reveal to him that she's Jewish. She's hiding her faith. And... Um, uh, uh, someone decides that they want to, uh, history keeps repeating itself, they want to eradicate the Jews. And um, uh, uh, a relative of Esther came to her and said, you're the only one who can save us. Very long story short, you're the only one that can save us, but, but for, to save us you're going to have to come out of the closet and announce who you are and you're going to have to make an appeal to the king. And she says, I, I can't walk into his presence. He hasn't asked me to, if you don't, he hasn't asked me to come. And if he doesn't ask you to come, if you walk into his presence and he doesn't lower the scepter, then you're dead. To which Mordecai, the relative talking to Esther said, Esther 414, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. The King James famously says, who knows but that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. To which Esther says, I will go to the king even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. 
Now look, guys, for most of us, overcoming evil with good refers to the way we, that we show up every day and do our work and influence everything we can for good. But some of you have been put into positions where you're going to have to choose your moments to step up and to be the person who says, who's willing to risk it all to say, if I perish, I perish. If I lose my job over this, I lose my job over this. But this particular matter is of such import. I believe God has put me in this position to be able to speak to this particular thing. And so as a person of faith, when you're the one being put on the board, when you're the one getting promoted to executive vice president, when you get appointed to the CEO, when you're the person you know who's leading the team, I, th- I think I don't think every day we're supposed to be walking in there doing you know, battle. I think we're just supposed to be good and we're supposed to be people of faith and we're supposed to be doing good work and we're supposed to be influencing everything in the most positive way possible. But just consider there may come a moment or there may come moments when you're in the position you're in to step up and to make a difference and if necessary to risk it all in order to overcome evil with good. Of course the good news is the king put a scepter down, she gained respect the jews were saved and and i think you know most of the time that's the way things work out but we can't be afraid to use our influence for good okay here's the final thing let me quickly uh, offer this as my close here's the third thorn it's low expectations may sound like a strange thing to say in light of all the rest of this and all the things that could be talked about, but I I just want to finish it this way. Uh, You may be familiar with the Dutch phrase, um, do normal. I'm sure I'm not saying it correctly. In in English, it's do normal. And uh, this is a big part of Dutch culture, is to be normal or to act normal. It gets manifest in a lot of ways. You might notice that um, you'll frequently see, when you see these ratings of the happiest countries in the world, that the Netherlands is usually up there at the top of the list. And I, I, I read, obviously, I read a lot of things. I read that kind of stuff just kind of curious. Well, why are they happy? And, and there are actually several reasons that systemically, some really positive things that you could look at and say, I see why they're, they're a happy country. But at, at its root, I think it's this idea of be normal or do normal. Uh, uh, a CNBC article that I read a few weeks ago um, about you know the Netherlands being one of the happiest countries offers five reasons, and number four is just be normal. Uh, the, a famous Dutch saying, do normal, dat is al get goneg. How'd you like that? You didn't know I could speak Dutch. Which means just be normal, that's already crazy enough, meaning that if you, the CNBC article, that if you put in too many hours or too much effort into your job, you likely won't get any accolades. Instead, you might be on the receiving end of some eye rolls and sighs while also being told to just be normal, go home, and take some time for yourself. And I, this is an opinion, capital O, opinion, this is my opinion. I don't have verse for this. This is my opinion. I think the reason, one of the reasons, that they're so happy in the Netherlands is they have low expectations and they're rarely disappointed. In fact, I actually did read an article about that one time that I couldn't find this week. They, 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 just, they just be normal. It's, it's not like I, I expect a whole lot. And, and you find this in Dutch culture everywhere. I'll show you a pretty dramatic illustration of this in a few moments, but it, they, they, they want... You just be normal. So like at lunchtime, uh, a, a, a tour guide told us that they, 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 the, the common Dutch uh, lunch at lunchtime is white, they, get, they go in a little store, they buy white bread, they buy cheese, they buy mayonnaise, they make, they make mayonnaise and cheese sandwiches. It's the ultimate white bread and mayonnaise culture, which is why I moved away from Indiana, by the way, because I don't want to live in a white bread and mayonnaise culture. I like the spice of New Jersey and all these cultures and all that. Anyway, Anyway, nonetheless, I couldn't do it anymore, uh, uh, and, 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 and I don't even like to go back, just to be frank.
Frank. It just, I could get bored the minute I fly into Indiana airspace. Uh, 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 you, when you're, when you're, when you're in the Netherlands, when you're in the Netherlands, you don't, you don't eat at Dutch restaurants unless it's in the morning you get a Dutch pancake. That's a go for that. But the Dutch tour guides will say, you'll say, where, where should we eat? Give us a great Dutch restaurant. They'll say, don't eat a Dutch restaurant. The, 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 the Dutch food, it's just normal. You, you know, you know, I mean, how many of you went out for Dutch food last night? I mean, I, nobody in the room. But if I said Italian or I said Mexican or I said, you know, what, you, anyway, you get the point. It's just, it's just normal. I mean, that's just the way it is. It shows up in all kinds of ways. Just be normal. And this became into clear relief for me when, when we, uh, me and an elder in our church, Dr. Abe Thomas, were on a walking tour being led by a Canadian tour guide. Now, if you can get a Canadian person to talk about another culture being boring, you know and to all my Canadian friends, I don't know what to say except I'm sorry, okay? But this is a Canadian tour guide talking about us to us about this be normal thing in Dutch. Look at this, and I'll wrap this thing up. Say again what you said about being normal. So this Oh, is wait a second. You got to pause for a second. Mind. I'm sorry. I forgot this part. This is the memorial. This is in The Hague, the seat of government in, in the Netherlands. And by the way, I really like the Netherlands, and, and, and I like Dutch people. Okay, uh, this, but this is the seat of government, the Hague in the Netherlands, and, and they're showing us the monument to the Constitution. That's what you're looking at here. Can we start it over from the beginning? This is the monument to the Constitution in the Netherlands. Say again what you said about being normal. So this is the, oh, yeah, this is the monument to the Constitution yeah. in the Netherlands. Yeah, this is the physical representation of du normal. The whole expression is be normal even then you're crazy enough. That is as normal as you can get. <laughs> sure is. We're comparing this in our minds to to, to Washington DC. Feeling better about being an American. The memorial to the Constitution. Now compare that. Let's go to D.C. Let's look at the Constitution Gardens with the Washington Memorial in the background. What, what do you want? You want the normal, just be normal thing in The Hague? Or do you take that? Let's go. Let's look at the Lincoln Memorial. Thankfully, some architect didn't say, let's just be normal. Let's just be normal, right? Or let's go to the, to, to, to the Martin Luther King uh, 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 Memorial. Uh, Thankfully, somebody had a majestic vision, right, of, of what this was, this kind of thing. You walk in that space, and I've been there several times, you walk in that space and your heart leaps. You're so inspired. You're so moved. It's an amazing thing to experience. So, so, so to, to, for as far as I'm concerned, you can have normal, and then you can have something more than normal. And I, and I just want to say that I think too many people who call themselves people of faith have low expectations about themselves and have fallen into a just be normal, don't expect too much of myself, and we won't be too disappointed mentality. That's the thorn. Here's the rose. Expect like a believer. Amen. Expect like a believer. I believe that people of faith should have high expectations, particularly in the context of this discussion about our work. We should hope for and attempt great things wherever we are assigned or called. And I think too many of us have low expectations of ourselves and the impact we can make and what's possible for a person of faith. You're just thinking, listen, listen, I, I, I want to say this kindly, but don't just think, I'm just going to go and be a nice moral person here. Of course, go and be a nice person there and, and a moral person, of course. But don't just think like that. Have high expectations about the way you, as a person of faith, are going to impact on that place where you work. Thank God history has been shaped by people of faith who wanted and who went after big things. A David who said, I'll take on Goliath. A Paul who said, I'm going to preach where the gospel has not been preached without whom we wouldn't be sitting here now. Jesus who said, you know who I'm going to redeem? I'm going to redeem the whole world. This nation is formed by people who are ambitious. I mean, read the autobiographies, the biographies of the 
founding fathers. They're, it's threaded full of ambition. I have some of it stuff of that stuff here, but, but I'm out of time, or I'd read it to you. But John Adams or, or Abraham Lincoln, tremendously ambitious. As a 23-year-old man, an open letter to his constituents saying, I have but one ambition, and that's to be considered, considered worthy of you thinking that I'm great in your eyes. Or, or look at, thank God Martin Luther King Jr. didn't say, let's just be normal. He said, I have a dream. I have a dream. And, and I just, I feel like I want to spark something in some of us to, to know that being a person of faith is, is, is about going after something. Faith wants things. Faith expects things. Faith goes after things. In the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews, the scripture says the act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. Some of you this week are going to be called to to start thinking about what an act of faith would look like in your work life that will distinguish you from the crowd. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death. By faith, Noah built a ship. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call. By an act of faith, he lived in the country, promised him. By faith, barren Sarah became pregnant. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac. By an act of faith, Joseph prophesied. By an act of faith, Moses' parents hid him. By faith, Moses refused the privilege of the Egyptian royal house. By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea. By faith, the Israelites marched. By an act of faith, Rahab welcomed the spies. I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. That's what the scripture says, not me. There are so many more. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, through acts of faith, they toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took the promises for themselves. They were protected from lions, fires, and sword thrusts, turned disadvantage to advantage, won battles, routed alien armies. In your work, be a person of faith. after it tomorrow. Come on!